is we who plow the prairies, built the cities where they trained, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving midst the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Every morning at half past four, you hear the cooks hop on the floor. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. And every morning just at five, you gotta get up, dead or alive. And it's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Now every morning at half past nine, you can hear the bosses cussing and crying. Hard times in the mill, my love. Hard times in the mill. Well, cotton boys don't make good enough to buy tobacco or a box of stuff. It's hard times in the mill, my love. Hard times in the mill. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Swaddle. This is Cosby Gibson. We are musicians, as Cosby said, from upstate New York. And we are pleased to be here, a part of this program presented by the Oneida. County History Society Center. Center. <laughs> now we'll go there. And today we'll be talking about and singing the songs of the labor union movement in the United States from the mid 1800s to about 1935. So let's get started. The bully got hot and the bill jumped off. Knock Mr. Jones's derby off. And it's hard times in the mill, my love. Hard times in the mill. The section hand standing at the door, ordering the sweepers sweep up the floor. And it's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. And every night when I go home, it's a piece of cornbread and old your bone. And it's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Ain't enough to break your heart to work all day and at night it's dark And it's hard times in the mill, my love Hard times in the mill Hard times in the mill Hard times in the mill Hi everybody um, as you may know, the United States is a political experiment, and with, with many new systems, it can include negative results. When our country embraced free enterprise and capital industry, it allowed great opportunities for business and the accumulation of wealth. However, it was an unregulated environment with few protections in the system, especially for workers. Soon, a hierarchy developed of the oppressors and the oppressed, that is, the business owners versus the workers. Now, many, many business owners took advantage of the low regulations and made demands upon the workers that were inhumane and damaging. But soon the workers began to make demands of their own. During the rift between these two groups, there was a turbulence and tragedy. The workers were fighting with all they had for their rights, and their goal was to establish a legally recognized group to protect them called labor unions. And these unions were to bring strength and organization to the workers and to help them attain fairness in the face of the greed and impossible demands of the era. Now let's rewind a moment and reveal to you how the oppression of the workers began. Before the 1700s, most workers were either farmers or craftspeople. But in the 1800s and 1900s, the factories became a way of life with the invention of the cotton gin, the production of artillery for the Civil War, and the beginning of gasoline and electricity. Many farmers became factory workers because it seemed that working in a factory would be better because of the predictable income. Some of the industries that grew because of the factories and mechanization were textiles, mining, lumbering, building materials, clothing, chemicals, and even toys. If you are unfamiliar with this part of history, it is called the Industrial Revolution. Well, what exactly were the harsh working conditions in the factories? They were things like working long hours, such as 12-hour days. Uh, factory owners would, would demand more production 
at a faster rate and for the same pay. And additionally, the factory environments were often toxic, such as, like Tom said, coal mining and chemical production. And the tasks of the factory work can be boring and repetitive, which affects a person's psychology and pride. And also unsafe was faulty machinery, buildings, work practices. Sounds like just about everything, really. <laughs> Um, a very frightening example of this, uh, you may have heard of this, a treacherous triangle shirt waist company in New York City in 1911. It was a fire, and 147 people died because the exits were locked as a precaution against the interruption of work. So they locked the workers in so they had to keep working. You might like to know that the company's owners were indicted for manslaughter. Now here's the song, it's just coming off of that, it's such a terrible tragedy. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe that people would do that. Um, but here's a song called The Commonwealth of Toil, and it speaks of the unfair working conditions as well of the dreams as of the dreams from the workers for a better life of those days. So here we go, Commonwealth of Toil. Start. The gloom of mighty cities midst the roar of whirling wheels. We are toiling on And our masters hope to keep us ever thus beneath their heels And to coin our very life fold into gold But we have a glowing dream of how fair the world would seem When each man could live his life secure and free When the earth is owned by labor and there's joy and peace for all in the commonwealth of toil next to me. They would keep us cowed and beaten, cringing meekly at their feet. They would stand between each worker and his bread. Shall we yield our lives up to them for the bitter crust we eat? Shall we only hope for heaven when we're dead? Could we have a glowing workers in the factories included a wide, wide range. There were men, women, and even children. There were recent immigrants and long-term citizens. Women were mostly in the textile clothing industries with children, while the men were in mining and physical labor. There are many incidences of unfairness against each of these groups, but the most shocking may be against children. They would start in the labor force as early as six years old and were sometimes beaten during worker and owner conflicts. Interestingly, children would join side by side with adults in the strikes and demonstrations. The workers were fighting for fairness and humane conditions. They needed to earn enough money to support their families. And they needed health care, paid sick days, time off, and other rights to make sure that working people can do their jobs and take care of their families. They needed an environment that was safe, and they needed to be able to thrive in life with their families and communities. One of the most important requests made by the workers was to have an eight hour workday. This would be a big change from the 10 to 12 hour workdays that they had now. 
and then they had to suffer through. All they were saying was eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, and eight hours of leisure. And this seems a lot more healthier. Yes. Um, the, work, the workers felt so strong about this reduced hours that they planned a big strike and a public demonstration just about this issue. The strike is now infamous in history for its violence and its complications. It is named the Haymarket Strike, and it took place in Chicago in 1885. The Haymarket Strike drew over 30,000 workers, and because the workers were absent from work, many of the factories had to stop production. Hundreds of fights broke out, and the police were called in with clubs and guns. Four workers died, and many were injured. The scene became more complicated, if possible, when a group of anarchists got involved. Anarchists were among the supporters of unionization. <laughs> the leaders of this group convinced the workers and armed themselves with weapons. And at this suggestion, an unknown person decided to throw a bomb, which killed seven police officers, seven police officers and, 60, and injured 67 people, which was really out of hand in my mouth. But, um, <laughs> the leaders of the group were accused and tried uh, they were finally executed, even though there was no evidence that they were responsible for the bomb. On the day of the leader's funeral, though, 250,000 people came into the streets to show their anger at the unfair conviction. The Haymarket strike is now a symbol of the unfairness that can occur in an unbalanced capitalist society. You may be glad to know that all the violence of the Haymarket strike did lead to victory. In fact, the eight-hour workday is an industry standard today. We have the righteous unionizers to thank for that. This next song tells us how important the eight-hour day is and why the workers should fight for it. The name of the song is called Eight Hour Day. <clears throat> We're brave and gallant minor boys who work in underground. For courage and good nature, no finer can be found. Eight hours we have for working, eight hours we have for play. Eight hours we have for sleeping in free America. We work both late and early to get but little pay to support our wives and children in free America. Eight hours we have for working, eight hours we'd have for play, eight hours we have for sleeping in free America. If Satan took the black legs, I'm sure would be no sin. What peace and happiness would be for us for working men. Eight hours we have for working, eight hours we have for play, eight hours we have for sleeping in free America. We're brave and gallant minor boys who work in underground. For courage and good nature, no finer can be found. <laughs> I saw some lips move into that one. If you know the song, you can sing along. Oh, yeah, definitely. You have no problem yeah. if you sing along. <laughs> Come on stage if you want. Um, <laughs> why not? And so the idea of the workers forming a legal group to ensure fairness came to the surface. People became and started organizing. Groups started contacting each other all around the nation to form stronger alliances. For example, in the 1880s, there was a notice posted up in Chicago by the Workmen's Party of the United States, and it read, Workmen of Chicago, throughout the land, our brothers are calling upon us to rise and protect our labor. For the sake of our wives and children and our livelihood, and our self-respect and livelihood, let us wait no longer. Organize at once, mass meeting tonight. Some of these groups believed in alternative philosophies such as socialism, communism, as we mentioned earlier too, anarchy. There, is. Ah, there we go. Right. <laughs> this could be a bit of a disadvantage for the unions as those theories were considered radical and offbeat. But whatever group or worker gravitated towards, one method to gain attention was the strike, a form of strike. The word strike originated from sailors. When they were in disagreement with their employers, they would strike their sails. And this term means to lower the sails of a ship. 
and the sailors would do this as a sign that they would not work. The earliest known worker protest in the United States occurred in 1786, and it was by the printing trade in Philadelphia. The result was a victory in raising the minimum wage to $6 a week. Big time money. Big, yeah. Six dollars a week. Well, they won. So that <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> um, but before we tell you the surprising stories of the strikers and the strikes, let us look at the role that the songs played in the labor movement. Songs were a very important way to inspire, strengthen, and to spread the message of the movement. They would be sung at public demonstrations as well as meetings of the growing groups. The musical instruments used were varied, such as banjo, guitar, and even sung with a voice only. And this was especially true in a crowd or in the street. Eventually, a book of these songs became available, and it is the famous Little Red Songbook. The subtitle of the book is Songs to Fan the Flames of Discontent. So it was, it was designed. So <laughs> that certainly describes the purpose, of, the purpose. Uh, but seriously, the Little Red Book was used by the workers to, quote, help build morale, promote solidarity, and lift the spirits of the working class during the labor movement. It was originally published in England, but the first printing in the United States came from the state of Washington in 1909. The book includes songs by movement leaders such as Ralph Chaplin, T-Bone Slim, and Joe Hill, as well as others. It is about four by five inches, and you guessed it, the color of the cover is red. As with many folk songs, the songwriters would use familiar tunes and replace its lyrics to match their message. This next song is an example of that method. It was called, it's called We Shall Not Be Moved, and the original tune is Lay the Lily Low, which was a hymn. Um, the lyrics were written in 1930s by an activist named Florence Reese, and interestingly, the song was also adapted for the 1960s civil rights movement. The chorus is really simple, so if you want, you'll catch on. If you want to sing along, that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> that would be...
<laughs> I thought she was going into it one more time for you guys. And so I was like, all right, we're all going to sing it again. I'm excited. <laughs> that was weird. Um, all right. Now, <laughs> we need to give you a realistic view of the dark era of the work history, though. The strikes and demonstrations were very serious and they were very violent. Um, they were not simple protests at that time. They were often full-fledged riots with weapons and shootings and bombs and fires and lots of destruction, property damage, injuries, and even death. Um, there was imprisonment, deportation, deportation, sorry, and uh, execution. And it's just absolutely incredible. Um, the militia and the police fought the workers, and the non-union workers fought the pro-union workers. There were sometimes tens of thousands of participants in the streets and around the factories protesting and fighting and striking. This is how strongly the workers felt that the conditions were unfair and how strongly the employers believed in capitalism and wealth. And it that doesn't look like much has changed today. <laughs> if you live or grew up in a place with a history of factory work, you may remember uh, stories and events that Tom's talking about, and you might even imagine the uproars of yesteryear as you pass by an abandoned building. Um, I, uh, from where we're from Fultonville and up in the Gloversville area in Johnstown, was apparently there was like a hundred factories in the past of gloves, a lot of leather factories. Uh, leathers and gloves, and they're all falling down and everything. But these were huge buildings, and you could there's you could some of the windows have fallen off and you can see the staircases up in there and I just sort of think you know the workers would go up every day up these staircases and all the people that would work there so and uh, yeah and I never knew that there actually were riots in Gloversville too actually uh, union riots so um, this next song is called which side are you on the title pretty much describes it which side are you on because if you're on the side of the owners we don't like you and uh, and if you're with a worker so, here we go. <laughs> Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? where the powers to be protected the strikers and all of that you would think but nope there's an incident named the battle of Matawan that took place in West Virginia in 1920 and the story is that the police chief of the town was a former miner 
and he protected the miners who felt sympathy for them striking. So what he did was when they were striking, he did not put a stop to the strike. Because of the confusion of that, and in the fact that the protesters were armed, that the police chief was protecting, it is considered the largest insurrection since the Civil War. Now, the factory owners did not take this laying down. For those who did not know, they would hire non-union workers to continue work in the factory as the strikes took place. And these temporary workers are considered traitors, and they're called scabs, by the pro-union groups. The pro-union workers would hire people to, quote-unquote, discourage the scabs from supporting the factory workers. Basically, they would physically attack them. And this is a quote from a person who was paid $50 for every scab that he discouraged. And he was describing his task. He says, oh, there ain't nothing to it. I gets my 50, then I goes out and I find the guy they want to have slugged. I goes up to him and I says to him, my friend, by way of meaning no harm, and then I gives it to him, biff, in the mug. <laughs> so basically hire people, just go hit people and scare them off. What a jam. <laughs> um, interesting, there were various forms of strike. For example, there was a wildcat strike, and that is a strike that is not approved by the unions and does not follow union rules. You think there'd be rules or not rules with the strike? Um, another type of strike is called the sit-down strike. And you guessed it, it is a demonstration where groups actually sit down and refuse to work until their requests are negotiated. The first sit-down strike was at Goodyear Tire Company in 1936. A year later in General Motors in Michigan, and both strikes, the workers won. Go workers. Um, well, four years later, the Supreme Court ruled the sit-down strike was illegal. Do um, you think that might have been some lobbying going on there? <laughs> and in any case, this next song is called Sit Down, and it, impresses, it, in, it inspires the sit-down strikes, and that is the message, is to sit down to stand up for your rights. When they tie the can to a union man, sit, sit down, down, sit down. When they give him the sack, they'll take him back. Sit down, sit down, sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you got them beat. Sit down, sit down. When they smile and say no raising pay, sit down. Come, just twiddle your thumbs, sit down, sit down. When you want them to know that they better go slow, sit, sit down, down, sit down, sit down and take a seat, sit down and rest your feet, sit down, you got them beat, sit down, sit down. When the boss won't talk, don't take a walk, sit down, sit down. When the boss sees that, you'll want a little chat. Sit down, sit down, sit down and take a seat. Sit down and rest your feet. Sit down, you've got them beat. Sit down, sit down. As a side note, the labor union and the civil rights movements actually have had a shared vision from the beginning. The civil rights leaders, and often labor leaders too, their goals are to offer a voice for everyone in society. And this involvement continues today. The following song is called, There is Power in a Union. 
and it is written by a major figure in the union movement named Joe Hill. And we'll talk about Joe in a few minutes, but for right now, this is there is power in a union. freedom from wage slavery then come join the grand industrial band or would you from misery and hunger be free come on do your share lend a hand there is power there is power in a band of working folk when we stand hand in hand there's a power there's a power that must rule in every land one industrial union brand. Would you have mansions of gold in the sky and live in a shack that's way in the back? Would you have wings up in heaven to fly and starve here with rags on your back? No, huh? There's a power, there's a power in a band of working folk when we stand hand in hand. Like sluggers to beat in your head. Don't organize all unions despise. If you want nothing before you are dead, shake hands with your boss and look wise. There's a power, there's a power in a band of working folk. When we stand hand in hand, there's a power, there's a power that must rule in every land. One industrial union. So come on, ye workers from every land, and come join the grand industrial band, cause then our share of this earth shall demand. Come on, do your share, lend a hand. There's a power, there's a power in a band of working folk. When we stand, when we stand, hand in hand, hand in hand, there's a power, there's a power that must rule in every land. One industrial union. so many honorable and effective people who led the groups of workers to unionization. Some even lost their lives. Three of the famous leaders are Bill Haywood, Mother Jones, and Joe Hill. Mother Jones, whose name was also Mary Harris Jones, was an Irish-born American, and she was a dressmaker and a teacher. She was the founder of the Industrial Workers of the World Organization. She was also called the most dangerous woman in America, and the grandmother of all agitators. <laughs> so, <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Her husband was also a union organizer, but sadly he and their four children died of yellow fever before Mary was 30. And then she lost her home, her dress shop, and her possessions in the Great Chicago Fire. So she then became deeply involved in supporting unionization and in being a lifelong organizer, especially for children. Um, interesting, it is said that the song, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, is written about Mother Jones and is in reference to her travels to coal mining camps in the Appalachian Mountains to spread the word of unionization. And you may already know that today there's a magazine called Mother Jones that um, investigates injustices in our world. So. Another notable personality was named, Patrick, you turn around to everybody your shirt, please? Joe Hill! Joe Hill. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. And Joe Hill was, and that's an original shirt. Um, and he was, Joe Hill was a Swedish American, and he was an immigrant worker. He was also a songwriter and a cartoonist, 
and he was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, we are learning today many of the strong members of the movement would be falsely accused of crimes and ordered to spend time in jail and try to bring down the movement. This happened to Joe too. But Joe was accused of murdering a police officer and was sentenced to death at the age of 36. This next song is in honor of Joe Hill and it is called Joe Hill. It, is written, it was written in 1938 and you might have heard it sung by lots of different people but mostly famous of all probably Joan Baez. Um, the song describes a conversation between a worker and the ghost of Joe Hill and the message is don't mourn, organize. So here we go, Joe Hill. <clears throat> I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. In Salt Lake, Joe says I to him, him standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I ain't dead, says Joe, but I ain't dead. The copper bosses killed you, Joe, they shot you, Joe, says I, takes more than guns to kill a man, says Joe, why didn't die? Says Joe, I didn't die. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes. Says Joe, what they forgot to kill went on to organize. Went on to organize. Joe, he laid dead. He says to me, Joe Hill ain't never died. When working men are out on strike, Joe Hill is by their side. Joe Hill is by their side. From San Diego up to Maine, in every mine and mill, where workers strike in organized. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, your ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. What are some of the other influences in the factories, workers, and unionization? World War I kept the factories busy making war equipment. These items were also sold allies to Europe. The factories boomed and could afford to pay the workers better wages and give them vacations, paid no less. Um, but then it took the stock market crash, brought everything down, and the Great Depression, Businesses started to fail, workers started to lose their jobs, and families became homeless. It was also the time of the Dust Bowl, with dust storms on the farmlands. There were tent communities, and people fled to the areas to find work, other areas. Since Americans had little money to spend on manufactured goods, some of the factories shut down. So now factory owners had to reduce the workers' pay and increase their hours again, so they sort of lost ground. And as a result, the strikes began again with even more strength than ever. But do not fret, because Franklin Roosevelt came to the victory. <laughs> he became president in 1932, and Roosevelt favored the union. He also created jobs. He also created jobs with a group called the Civilization Conservation Corps, the CCC. And in that, workers were hired to repair roads and dams 
and forests, trails, and the like. If you go hiking at all in the Adirondacks and stuff, you see the trails. They're absolutely amazing mm -hmm. what those guys do. They walk in with giant 100-pound packs and cut. And it's insane. So thank Franklin Roosevelt for that one. Um, actually, he developed a legal act that encouraged bargaining and negotiation among workers and employers. Interesting, a program he developed was the Federal Theater Project and the Federal Writers Project for artists, musicians, actors, and writers. And because of his support, Roosevelt was re-elected, and he, was, he has made great strides by creating Social Security, unemployment insurance, and minimum wage. Even though there was so much conflict between workers and employers, there was actually some instances where the two groups cooperated to, for a better workplace. And the first example is the well-known Ford Motor Company. And the founder, Henry Ford, had an idea in which his workers became his customers and created a win-win situation. He designed an assembly technique that divided the work into stages with a worker at each stage performing a single task. And this made production faster without more effort on the worker's part. It also increased production, so Ford was able to raise the salaries to $5 a day, which I guess was big. Huh? $6 a week for $5 a day. <laughs> in 100 years. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and also they made it a short work day. So in exchange, the workers would buy the cars from the Ford factory. And in those days, cars were not as attainable as today or available, I guess. And um, so owning one was a big advantage. And this helped improve the workers' lifestyle, and it supported the factory that was also the group's livelihood. So they worked more like a group. Another plan that took place in western Mohawk Valley, it was called the Moha Mohawk Valley Formula. And it was created by the president of the Remington Arms Factory in nearby Elaine, New York. You know Elaine? Um, with this idea, the pro-union workers would suppress any strikers themselves. In exchange, the action would be followed by a mass meeting and an opportunity for negotiation that included the factory owner, the workers, and even the public. This era of unionization was a battle of good and evil. Its lessons include that wealth brings greed when what we really need is prosperity and sharing. And also that standing up for what you believe can be successful and has become part of the American way. To honor the effort of these groups and all of our ancestors, let's remember their struggle when we hear their stories when we read the historic plaques, when we see places like the factories we were talking about, and maybe say thank you to those people who maybe were descendants or are unionizers to um, help with this struggle. Hmm. And on that note, let's finish the afternoon with a rousing rendition of the song Solidarity Forever. It is sung to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The words are simple and easy, and uh, it was written by Ralph Chamberlain in 1915, and we would love for all of you guys to sing along. The chorus is really super easy. The chorus pretty much goes solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever. <laughs> for the union makes us strong. So there we go. I think we uh, can do it. <laughs> I think you got it. Okay. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. Is there aught in what we hold in common? Greedy parasite who would lash us into surf the men, crush us with his might. Is there anything left for us to but organize and fight? For the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving midst the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever.
forever, for the union makes us strong. They have taken untold millions that they've never toiled to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their hoardy power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. In our hands is place of power greater than the hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. One last time! <laughs> solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes so wonderful. Thank you for signing up. That was so good. Thank you very much. Wow, that was great. Um, once again, my name is Tom Storr. This is Cosby. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you to the Oneida County History Society Center for having us. You guys have been great. Have and a great Patrick rest of the weekend. God bless you all.